We have gathered a internationally renowned panel here to start off this year's strategy conference. The title of this panel is Many Dangers, Little Money, Strategic Choices During the Interwar Years. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm serious when I say this is a very, very talented group. We have uh, on our far left, Dr. Rob Satino from North Texas, the expert on the German way of war and how it developed. Next to him, we have Dr. Mike Nyberg from the Department of National Security Strategy here at the uh, Army War College, uh, really in his element looking at the aftermath of World War I in Europe. Next to him, we have uh, Dr. Tammy Biddle, the foremost expert on the development of interwar air power. Obviously, you know, she has clout. She got a full name on her name tag. Uh, and then you have myself, who is famous for gathering smart people around me, so I look good, too. <laughs> now, let me see. I'm going to set the stage for this panel, and then we will we'll run through uh, some comments, and then I have a couple of questions, and we'll open it to the audience. So you guys are going to, this is not a passive environment. You're all going to have to participate because we've got two hours to fill. The uh, uh, reception is not going to start any earlier. <laughs> So it's to our, all of our benefit to, to make this active uh, as we try to look at what uh, is relevant from this tumultuous time in our history for, for the situation we are in today. Uh, again, I'll, I'll set the stage. Uh, from my perspective, as kind of the United States rep on this panel, uh, disillusioned with major land force deployment across the Atlantic, the United States pivoted to the Pacific to contain a rising power first with sea power and treaties, and later with additional perceived deterrence from air power. Ground forces were drastically slashed. Politicians focused on improving the economy at home and utilizing diplomacy abroad. This is 1919, not 2013. As is usually the case, however, the nation was about to suffer a case of strategic whiplash as a rising threat in another part of the world could not be ignored by the United States or its allies. To start off, we'll I'm going to turn to Rob to talk about the choices faced by this rising new threat in Germany. Thanks, Con. For uh, military historians uh, across the board, the interwar years have, have become kind of legendary, the, the era of, of military reform par excellence. Uh, the, the basics are, are pretty clear. Uh, the 20 years from 1918 to 1939 uh, did in D.C. heated debate over the issue of mechanization. And now, now what that meant in the period was the degree to which the various militaries were willing and able to assimilate new industrial technology into their arsenals, but especially vehicles, and especially, most especially, tanks and, and aircraft. I, I, that's what I've been studying for most of my uh, adult life. Now, beyond that simple statement, uh, the more you learn about a period, the more you realize how often you need to qualify those basic statements. Beyond that simple statement, uh, things, get, uh, things get a bit murky. And I guess that, I'll, I'll start in the murk. F following World War II, a very a, a well-established historical narrative emerged about the interwar period, and one that was highly stylized, and I think you'll recognize it as even, even tendentious in nature. Uh, we can instinctively recognize it, I think, as a, as a literary trope, more fictive than it is historical. And I could parody it this way. Uh, on the one side of the debate, there were military prophets, Brilliant young progressives arguing for rapid modernization. More tanks, more aircraft, more modernity. The good guys, in other words. Uh, on the other, the hidebound forces of reaction. Military conservatives, cavalry officers. Colonel blimps of every description. Now, there is also a general consensus as to the results of the period. And I think it, too, is relatively easy to parody. Of all the armies of the era, the Germans were the ones to get it right. They figured it out. They invented Blitzkrieg, or lightning war, uh, spearheading their attacks with tanks and aircraft, in other words, and as a result, conquered much of Europe in the opening years of World War II. You know, we could then throw in all the others who didn't get it. The, the, the French didn't get it, not even close. 
and the whole world would find out in 1940. Uh, the British could have gotten it, but they were too busy policing India. The Russians almost got it, but they murdered everybody right before the war started in the Stalinist purges. Uh, the Italians, they didn't get it. They didn't even know what, that, that it was, there was an it to be gotten. And even if they had been able to recognize it, they wouldn't have been able to afford it. Now, I, I've been involved in this, in this issue for, for years now, decades now, which pains me to say. And I've seen some significant shifts dramatic shifts in it. In the 60s and 70s, US analysts were looking to the Germans for clues about how to fight the then current Soviet uh, threat. This was the age of the, uh, of the foreign military study series, the thousands of interviews, tens of thousands of man hours with German commanders of various ranks describing World War II in, in often excruciating detail. Of course, ground zero for that whole process today is the, the uh, MHI here at AHEC. I've spent my share of my life looking through those files. The 1980s, when I was coming of age as a scholar and the Army of Excellence was coming of age uh, to, to airland battle, uh, we see the apotheosis of this trend. German military doctrine reaching back to Moltke, 19th century, was being plumbed for clues about correct doctrine, the origins of Blitzkrieg the evolution of the operational level of war. Uh, think uh, of Trevor Dupuy's book, a, a Genius for War, which could only be, a book written in that period could only be about the German army with a title like A Genius for War. After 1991 came a shift to small wars and German doctrine no longer seemed uh, to matter all that much. Now you were just as likely to see works that demythologize German war making, uh, especially in World War II, as being relentlessly operational, insufficiently attuned to strategy. Perhaps we might say too kinetic. I'm tempted to walk up to that statue of Frederick the Great and tell him the Prussian army was too kinetic and seeing what his response would be to that. I'm thinking here of a very fine book by scholar Jeff McGargy, I'm sure many in the room know it, uh, Inside Hitler's High Command. A further shift saw a new emphasis on the Wehrmacht's atrocities, crimes against civilians, complicity in Hitler's war of aggression and the Shoah. And that's pretty much where we are now in terms of our anal analysis of the German army. Now my point is that how you read the Wehrmacht in World War II will necessarily determine your reading of the German achievements in the interwar period. What I'd suggest we do here is to synthesize these various phases in order to get, not at the truth, uh, at least a more complete picture of the truth. Uh, certainly, the Germans performed some amazing feats in the interwar era. They were facing as bleak an international situation as you can get, roughly analogous to the debacle at Jena and Auerstadt in 1806, when Napoleon had first smashed the Prussian army and then, then cut, the state, uh, you know, cut the state by 50% in size. The Treaty of Versailles, likewise, cut Germany down to size. Its disarmament clauses left the interwar army a shadow of its former self, 100,000 men, 4,000 officers, 10 very small divisions, three of which uh, had to be cavalry according to the terms of the treaty, horse cavalry in 1919. It was forbidden offensive weapons, tanks, aircraft, uh, heavy ar forms of heavy artillery. The treaty prohibited conscription, creating an army of long-term volunteers only, 12 years for the enlisted ranks and 25 years for officers. It was an al also an army that probably because of that had the highest suicide rate in the interwar period. You join and didn't like it three months in, you have only 11 months and nine, 11 years and nine months to go. The treaty abolished the general staff and the war academy that produced officers for the general staff. Finally, it saddled Germany with a huge reparations bill at the same time as its territorial clauses, occupation of the Rhineland, for example, removed uh, roughly 30% of the German tax base. Now, just as it had been after 1807, so it was after 1918. A rebirth came swiftly. The German military, uh, with the connivance of the civilian authorities, resisted the Allies on every level. It did so actively, working with forbidden weapons often designed and tested abroad. It did so passively, dragging its feet by a variety of means on weapons inspections, and that subject alone is, is worth an, uh, an hour of discussion. It created a camouflage general staff under the harmless sounding name of Truppenamt, troops office. It continued to train general staff officers under an even more harmless sounding name of Führergehilfen, 
that is leadership assistance. Thank you. Its small size allowed it to keep standards at the highest, and it trained and drilled more obsessively than any army on the planet in the 1920s. In particular, it carried out the most comprehensive program of exercises, war games, and open field maneuvers of any army of the era, with the possible exception of the Soviets. Now, the, the result of those exercises was an army that was uniquely configured to win early victories in the war that followed. It featured a concept of integrated combined arms uh, based on a new large-scale mechanized formation, the Panzer Division. It was built, the division was, around its tank component, but it included its own infantry, artillery, engineers, supply units, all of which were either motorized or mechanized, and thus could keep up with the pace of the tanks. After 1935, the new Air Force, the Luftwaffe too, was geared for cooperation with the ground forces rather than for deep strikes against enemy industry or population centers. Finally, the Germans gave a great deal of thought in this period to the issue of command and control of these new mechanized formations. If armies were going to be mechanized, they were going to be able to cover hundreds of miles per day. They could only be commanded with the aid of the most modern communications technologies, which in the 1930s meant, of course, the radio. An invention that let the commander monitor the battlefield in something approaching real time, if everything worked. After a series of hit and miss uh, exercises in the late 20s and early 30s, and the, the German, the Reichswehr, the interwar army, ran, ran one Funkübung after another, radio exercise after another. After a series of hit and misses, the Germans came to realize that the minimum C2 requirement was a radio set in each tank which is considered quite exorbitant and, and, and a waste of equipment when it was first suggested, but it was the only thing that worked. Now, I don't think I need to tell anyone here the effectiveness of these units in the early campaigns of World War II. The Panzer Division was the most flexible combat formation in the field. It could assault, penetrate, exploit, hold ground, and regroup to do it all over again much more rapidly than could its opponents in this phase of the war, this phase being roughly the first two years of World War II. It also pr proved very resilient in the defense, something we get a chance to prove in the last phase of the war, that being roughly the last four years of the war from 41 to 45. So the Germans got it, we might say, and well done. Good for them. In order to say they got it, however, we first have to problematize the word it. And this, it seems to me, is a crucial point. What the Germans did in the 30s was not so much invent something new called blitzkrieg. I, I, this has been kicked around for so long now. The Germans did not invent the term, rarely used it outside of quotation marks. It never had any doctrinal meaning. It was never used in a manual, for example. It just meant a quick war. So they did not do, invent something new called Blitzkrieg as they restored a very old and traditional pattern of war making. As far back as the 17th century, that is the great elector, but certainly by the 18th, and that would be Frederick the Great, whose statue sits here on the, on the grounds. Prussia's rulers realized that their small and relatively impoverished state on the European periphery had to fight short wars. Kurz und vivis, Frederick the Great said, short and lively wars. Serving an ambitious duchy crammed into a tight spot, surrounded by larger and more powerful neighbors, uh, lacking much in the way of defensible boundaries. There are rivers in Prussia, but if you get to them, you've penetrated to the heart of the state. It's essentially a flat sandbox. Prussian officers over time internalized the notion that they could not win long and drawn out wars of attrition. They had to find a way to fight short, sharp wars that ended in decisive battlefield victory. The solution was something they called Bewegungskrieg, which on the sex appeal scale, Blitzkrieg is here, and Bewegungskrieg, which no one can pronounce, and you can't use it in the title of a book because no American audience would ever recognize it, uh, but it was what is the term the Germans used, the war of movement, and I would actually define it as the war of movement on what we might consider the operational level. It was a way of war that stressed maneuver on the operational level, the movement of large units, division, corps, armies, 
Prussian commanders sought to maneuver these formations in such a way as to strike the mass of the enemy a rapid uh, annihilating blow within weeks of the outset of the fighting. The desired end state, something called the Kesselschlacht, literally the cauldron battle, but, but more really a, a, a battle of encirclement, hemming in the enemy on all sides prior to destroying him through a series of concentric operations. Now, seen in that light, the interwar German development of the Panzer Division makes a certain kind of long-term sense. Rather than being a sudden inspiration or a eureka moment, they're sitting and fiddling around and suddenly someone invented a Panzer Division. What the Panzer Division was, was merely a tool to fight war in a way that the Germans instinctively recognized as normative. Now, certainly, that's a way of war with immense blind spots. Logistics were always an afterthought. Even in the shortest of German campaign victories, the logistics were a mess by the end of the day. Intelligence was rarely on the front burner. Uh, for most Prussian and later German officers, intelligence meant a quick personal reconnaissance by the officer in charge. Rode out ahead and checked things out. Counterintelligence was definitely substandard, maybe the worst in Europe. Think about losing the Enigma machine before the war even started. But it was what it was. Karl uh, Marx once said that men make their own history. It's a very famous quote. But they do not make it just as they please. They do not make it under circumstances chosen by themselves, but under circumstances directly encountered, given, and transmitted from the past. And so it was with the German army. So it was with the Reichswehr in the interwar period. Thanks. Thanks, Rob. Well, the, f the first nation that had to face up in that first two years of the war and everything was working pretty good for the Germans is, of course, the French. So, Mike? Thanks, Con. Um, I want to thank Con. I've, been, I've had this one circled on my calendar all year. The chance to be on a panel here with Con, Tammy, and, and Rob is uh, something I've been looking forward to for months. So, Con, thank you for, um, thank you for the invitation. Um, I want to start with why the French army as it looked back from 1918, why it believed it had won the First World War. And there are three schools of thought in France that kind of overlap, and they're important for the way that France approached the interwar years. The first of those is the, is the most difficult to understand because it is the one that is historically the least accurate. And that is the idea in France that France won the war because of its people, not because of its machines. Now France will tell you, that the French will tell you, that they, not the British, were the first to put tanks on the battlefield. They will tell you that they, not the British, were the first to put dedicated air squadrons in the air over the Western Front. So machines are an important part of what the French did to win this war. But the mythology that comes out at the end of the war stresses the people. It stresses things like the miracle of the Marne, uh, when the French army moved a brigade of men uh, by taxicab, and that brigade of men turned this very important battle in September 1914. Uh, so the first focus is that it is people, not machines, which led to a certain blindness in the French army in the interwar years towards technological innovation, that the, the army, the manpower, was what won. Second was the argument that it was the unity of French society. France is a notoriously fractured place, a place that had been through a couple of revolutions. Uh, when the war broke out in 1914, there was a lot of fear among French analysts that France would follow something like the 1870-1871 model, that the Third Republic would come apart, that France would break into civil war. Uh, none of that happened in 1914. And, uh, Jean-Jacques Becker, a very famous French historian, um, says a wonderful phrase that 1914 was the last thing France agreed on, which is a wonderful phrase. Uh, but that at least for the period 1914-1918, what the French called the Union Sacré, the sacred union, held together. And the third one was that France won because of its alliances. France won because it was fighting as part of a wider coalition that involved Russia, it involved Italy, it involved Great Britain, and it involved the United States. And if that coalition had different goals, and if that coalition had different aims, it was nevertheless true that France fought with friends at its side. Um, and those three things, I think, are very important as we, as we move forward. So to transition from that to the world of the post-war, um, it's important to note that people, the reason France won the war, are in short supply at the end of the First World War. France enters something that French historians today call les années noires, the dark years, uh, which indicates both the decline in French birth rates um, it indicates uh, a real problem demographically that France has in relationship to a much larger Germany, and a Germany that just gets larger still in 1938 with the Anschluss that adds six million uh, Austrians. The second is that the end of that unity in France. Um, this is a topic that, is, as Rob said, is, deserves an hour in and of itself. But in France at the end of World War I, there is no master narrative. That is, there is no commonly accepted belief uh, 
about what the First World War really was for. The recovery of Alsace and Lorraine just doesn't explain to the French the loss of 1.2 million people. It just doesn't. There has to be some sort of explanation. Um, and what happens in France, as happens in Germany and happens in other places, is that a variety of explanations emerge. Um, and in France, because the French are uh, um, uh, a diverse pluralistic society, unlike Germany, uh, those debates enter into the public arena and become really corrosive. And I'll talk about those a little bit more. So if 1914 is something that the French agree on, uh, after 1914, especially after 1918, there's far less that they agree on. And like I said, I'll come back to that in just a second. Most importantly, those four countries that I mentioned that are part of the alliance, Italy, which had been part of the winning alliance in 1914, Italy enters in 1915. By the early 1920s, Italy has gone fascist under Mussolini and looks more threat than ally. The possibility of a French government negotiating with the Soviet Union is out. Even the socialist governments in France in the 1930s don't want to negotiate with the Bolshevik um, Soviets. Great Britain is showing some great reluctance to enter into any kind of collective security arrangement. And the United States, of course, even if it does eventually decide it wants to come in, will take years, as it did in World War I, months or years, to come to its senses and join. So from the French perspective, the alliances that, that made them strong are gone. And finally, um, looking at the Treaty of Versailles, which Rob mentioned, um, although the Germans believed that the Treaty of Versailles had really very badly damaged them, the French, as they emerge into the 1920s, are quite aware that the Treaty of Versailles has done very little to solve the real problem. And here you have a, a tremendous break in civil military relations that becomes quite important in France in the 20s and 30s, where there are different interpretations as to what went wrong during the Treaty of Versailles. Uh, the military people believing that things like the disarmament, banning a general staff, forbidding them from testing weapons, all of those things are pointless if there's no mechanism to enforcement. If there's no way to know whether they're actually doing it or not, they're pointless. Um, and the civilian interpretation, at least on the left, the, the governments that are going to run France for much of the 20s and 30s, uh, the argument is that the problem with the treaty is that it didn't recognize the basic problem that you're punishing the wrong people. You are punishing the, the German people rather than the regime that was guilty for um, the war in the first place. So as you move forward from 1918 and move into the 1920s, the serious strategists in France are aware that despite losing 1.2 million people, Despite the tragedy of World War I, despite all of the things that went wrong, France comes out of the First World War in a significantly worse strategic position than when it went in. Most importantly, the fact that there is no powerful Eastern alliance, there is no country on Germany's east to counterbalance, makes France's problem a thousand times harder than the 1914 strategic problem. And they're already looking forward to a world where another world war might begin, and Germany doesn't have to worry about the Eastern Front at all and can focus its full weight in the West, which is, of course, exactly what happens. For this reason, France looks to something that it calls the Little Entente, and you can tell just by the phrasing how they feel about it, with Poland at the center. In other words, what France is trying to do is build a strong, independent Poland that can serve as the Eastern counterweight that Russia had served in 1914 and all the problems that come with this. So um, then it gets worse. And I'm just going to give you a couple of things here. France faces imperial issues. They face a war in Morocco that is very divisive and very problematic for France. They face military operations in Syria, which is a part of uh, the Turkish Empire, the old Ottoman Empire, that France gets as a part of the settlement of World War I. Now they have to send military forces into Syria to fight a war. They have to face the rise of Nazi Germany to their east with all of the questions and all of the uncertainties that are involved with what France's relationship with Germany will be going forward. They have to face a fascist regime to their south in Spain. They have to face a fascist regime to their southeast in Italy. So whereas in World War I, France really only had to focus on one frontier, the frontier with Germany, as it begins to think about defense planning in the 1930s, it has to worry about potentially an invasion across the Alps, an invasion across the Pyrenees, and an invasion across the Rhine. Now it has to worry about three invasions with no allies instead of one invasion with three allies. And that's a real problem. Um, it has to face not only fascism on its borders, but it has to face the real possibility of fascism at home with the growth of the Croix de Feu movement, uh, native French fascism, that is. And this is an issue that um, French scholarship still hasn't fully come to terms with. How much of the experience of World War II in France is the Germans forcing France to do things, and how much of it is the result of indigenous French fascism that begins in the 1920s and 1930s and carries itself all the way into the Vichy period. Um, 
it has to face those issues of, of, of a real lack of an alliance, and it has to face the issue of economic depression, of course, and labor unrest, a real lack of resources. So given that, and to kind of begin to sum up a little bit, um, France faces really four strategic options. Um, any one of the four can overlap with any others. The first, they know they have to do something about the empire. The imperial commitments which, was, which were supposed to make France money are not making France money. And this is another one of these issues that divides the French left and the French right. For the most part, it is the French left that is arguing for getting out of the empire, pulling up stakes and getting out. And if those of you that know the history of France know that this will reemerge at the end of World War II, first in Indochina and then again much more seriously for France in Algeria from 1954 to 1962, while the French right is arguing that France has to maintain its commitments to the empire and argues that if France runs the empire correctly, it can make money in a time of economic uncertainty. Second, France faces the choice of building up offensive capability that could allow France to respond to any series of crises, either in the empire or on its borders. This means building an offensive army based around airplanes, based around tanks, based around mechanized infantry, which is an extremely expensive proposition. And there is a division inside the French army that I wasn't quite sure how to fit into this talk, so it's in this little amoeba thing I have in the margin, so forgive me while I digress for just a, a, a little bit. The French army essentially promotes senior leaders based not upon what they're capable of doing to the army now, but based on who their mentors were in the First World War. So there is a branch that comes out of Joseph Joffre, the first French uh, head of army in, in, in the First World War, of soldiers that had worked under him, most notably Maurice Gamelin, who becomes the, the head of the French army during the defeat. Um, Gamelin and his ilk are operational specialists. That is, what they're trying to do is recreate the French army of the First World War, which really made its bones by being operationally mobile and being able, in 1914 at least, the second school comes from protégés of Ferdinand Foch, the great French strategist of the First World War. Um, they don't always do as well as their mentor. Um, as my father would say, that apple fell very far from that tree. Um, but they are people who are thinking about larger grand strategic issues. Men like Maxime Weygand, men who want to keep the empire as part of this process, meaning that their attention is not always exclusively focused on the problem coming from Germany. Third they can begin to think about what later becomes known as appeasement. That is, making adjustments to the Versailles Peace Treaty that will satisfy Germany. And not only satisfy Germany, in their minds, correct the injustices of what was at base an unjust treaty. So in their minds, you're not giving something to Germany for nothing. What you're doing is fixing the problem of a really awful treaty that you wrote. And some of you may know the fantastic quotation from Ferdinand Foch. Uh, Foch was the senior French military advisor to the Paris Peace Conference. He was so angry with the Treaty of Versailles that he refused to attend the signing ceremony. And he said on June 1919, June 28, 1919, this is not peace, this is an armistice for 20 years. So he missed that by three months. That, that's not bad. Um, so what you could do is look for some version, something you can do to the Germans to adjust the inequities of the treaty without in other words, to avoid a war. And to understand appeasement, I really think you need to understand two things that often get lost as appeasement has become a dirty word that perhaps it ought to be. The first is the awareness of French politicians that what you're doing is adjusting a treaty that really never should have been agreed to. It was a bad treaty, badly written. The second, and I think the more interesting one, there are plenty of French leaders who are saying, look, we're, we want to do some version of appeasement, not to avoid a war that we're afraid we will lose, but to avoid a war that we are afraid we are going to win. In other words, if you win another war like you won the First World War, what's the point? If the First World War did not leave you in a better position and killed 1.2 million people, what is the point of fighting a second one? So anything you can do short of giving up territory that is yours and short of putting yourself in a very bad strategic position might well be something worth considering. Third, or excuse me, fourth and final, what you can also do is put your defense dollars into defense. That is, you can put it into a system that will do the following things. One, it will send a signal of passive defense to the Germans and, importantly, to the British. It is a serious question among British strategists if the French are going to build up a strategic bombardment arm, and Tammy can speak to this better than I can, is it in Britain's best interest for France to have a major strategic bombardment arm? What happens if the French government does go fascist? <laughs> 
which is a very real possibility in 1936, 37, 38. If you're Great Britain, do you want a large French strategic air arm in the hands of the Quad of Feu? And the answer, if you're British, is no. ain't no way. <laughs> um, so what you can do by putting your defense into a static line of defenses is send a signal to A, Germany, that you're not building up tanks to come after them, and B, you're not building up a bomber fleet to come after Britain. Second, you can keep a large army inside the Maginot Line or inside this line of defenses that becomes the Maginot Line, and by doing so, you can keep soldiers out of the big cities, and you can keep them away from the major political rallies that are happening in the 1930s. You can keep the French army depoliticized in a way that the German and Italian armies were not. And a 1936 near coup in Paris underscores that to the French government. Third, and the, this should sound familiar, by building a series of defenses that are very expensive and require a lot of upkeep, you can use defense dollars to stimulate the civilian economy. You can take budget money that otherwise you could not spend on defense and put it into the budget as defense dollars and stimulate the construction economy. And that ought to sound familiar. And finally, by doing this, you can use the Maginot Line as a way to create what we would call a force multiplier. And by doing so, you can keep your personnel costs low. And all of those things should be familiar to an American audience in 2013. Thank you. Thanks, Mike. Okay, now we'll turn to the Brits who have an interesting position because they, they have a little more distance from Germany than the French do, but they're a lot closer than the Americans. So they, they, they create an interesting in-between case to look at in this situation. Tammy? Okay, well, like Mike, I'm very pleased to be here. So thanks, Con, for inviting me and putting me on this panel of distinguished folks to my right and left. Um, ironically, I'm the only person who did slides, and I'm truly the Luddite here. For, I, I don't, the only one without an iPhone, for instance. So it's <laughs> ironic, but I'm going to try to show slides and talk at the same time, which I may or, not, may or may not succeed at doing, but we'll give it a go. Okay. If you have ever seen the St. Pancras Station in central London, you know that its builders expected the empire to last forever. If there was ever an architectural statement of confidence, this was it. And one may forgive Britain's post-World War I population for thinking that greatness might last a while longer. While they had suffered a grievous blow, the full impact and scope, scope of it was masked in the 1920s by several factors. Britain was better off in relative terms than her potential rivals in Europe, all of whom had suffered even more than she had. Indeed, the, size, the land size of her empire had grown by some 27%. At sea, she dominated the route from Cairo to the Cape and from Cairo to Calcutta. A looming shift of power towards the United States was masked by that nation's retreat into isolation. Still, there were some blunt realities that had to be faced, and these would be faced in a context that reflected powerful, voice, powerful forces in Britain during the interwar years. These were, first, the fact that Britain was becoming increasingly a true democracy. And second, the fact that the economic impact of the First World War had placed an immense strain on Britain. The first of these had several important implications. It meant that the government would have to pay close attention to popular views, including and foremost, a powerful revulsion against war by people who had seen a war that had gone beyond their worst imaginings, had been not what they had expected in terms of time or suffering or cost. Uh, and for these folks, many of them, the League of Nations became a vessel filled with the hopes of a generation shocked and reeling from a war beyond their imagining. Second, there was a widespread desire to cut back on defense and invest in social programs. Many of these social programs had been promised during the war itself. And third, there was a desire to focus on imperial re relationships as opposed to European ones, to move Britain back to the sort of halcyon Victorian era when she tried really hard not to get involved in European affairs. The economic burden of World War I can be summed up well in one statistic. 
There had been an 11-fold increase in the size of the national debt between 1914 and 1918. By the late 1920s, the annual interest payments alone on this account consumed 40% of central government spending, as opposed to 12% in 1913. For most of the interwar years, and really right up until 1939, the British government perceived its number one enemy to be Britain's weak economy. This led the economically orthodox to argue that a reduction in the debt and a recovery of the government's credit should be the first priority. And it reminded policymakers of the fear, fearful costs of any future war. It seemed imperative to pare back on defense spending dramatically. Henceforward, the availability of funds would determine defense strategy and not vice versa. This gave the Treasury immense sway over strategic decision making pertaining to national defense. The 10 year rule of 1919 instructed the services to prepare their estimates, quote, on the assumption that the British Empire would not be engaged in any great war during the next 10 years. Extended on a rolling basis to 1932, this allowed the Treasury to demand that everything asked for by the defense chiefs be justified in terms of immediate need. With nearly all of Britain's enemies in tatters after the war, there was little that could be justified on that basis. Defense spending spiraled downward. The defense industry shrank dramatically, setting up a situation in which it would not be able to respond quickly to national need later on. Perception and memory played a role as well. Because it's not possible for any population to analyze its own war experience in a wholly objective way, the particular shaping of public and official memory of the Great War had a powerful impact on policies going forward. The Army, most strongly associated with the horror of trench warfare on the Western Front, was nearly as unpopular as war itself. And this fact was redoubled by the rise of the donkey's thesis, making the officer corps in particular especially unpopular, and the explosion of anti-war literature among the literati in the late 1920s, and of course you'll recognize names like Robert Graves, Wilfred Owen, Siegfried Sassoon, Frederick Manning, many others. The army shrank, and as it shrank, it lost many of the forward-looking tradesmen, and I'll use that term, but that was a sort of pejorative term at the time, many of the tradesmen of the middle classes, from artillery in particular, and according to Bidwell and Graham, was left to the fox-hunting classes, who were not particularly forward-looking, and I say that with um, some degree of dismay because I grew up fox hunting, but um, <laughs> nonetheless. And I, I will let you um, see a further comment on that particular uh, item by the very objective Sir Arthur Harris, uh, who had this to say about the British Army. The British instinct to eschew large standing armies was reinforced by the idea that land power might henceforward be defense dominant. While this notion had proven un manifestly untrue, uh, was proven manifestly untrue by the nature of the 1918 offensives and the development of the modern system of combined arms, popular memory was fixed on 1917 with Passchendaele being the dominant image. That's a before and after image of the uh, Third Battle of Ypres, Passchendaele. This gave the rising air theorists some running room. Douay insisted that air power was the new offensive arm par excellence, and he insisted that air power, the long range bomber in particular, offered the prospect of a shorter and therefore more merciful form of war fighting. In Britain, Trenchard had found himself in 1918 at the helm of a long-range independent <coughs> bombing force created in response to a popular outcry for better air defenses and also for retaliatory strikes against Germany. Then, upon later finding himself the post-war chief of the newly independent Royal Air Force, he had to fend off fierce and frequent challenges from the older services who desired the return of their air assets, for good reason, and he made two arguments in fending off those older services. He said, first of all, the RAF could do imperial policing on the cheap. 
This had appeal because whenever you would send an army off to a far-flung place, um, it tended to come down with cholera and everyone would die, which was very troublesome. Um, so Trenchard argued, well, he could have an isolated group of guys with bombers and keep people in line. <clears throat> and this was, of course, being utilized in places like Mesopotamia, Waziristan, and Somaliland. Plus que change, plus c'est la même chose. And Trenchard argued that the RAF, due to its ability to do long-range bombing, would have a deterrent role. And if forced into war, would be quickly able to force the enemy state onto the defensive through, a, quote, relentless and in incessant air attacks on the enemy's vital centers. The RAF did not have the actual capacity to carry that out in the 1920s, but that seemed, at the time, at least a mere technicality. For politicians in search of a sil silver bullet and a cheap one, this argument for strategic bombing had immense appeal. Britain's heavy dependence on sea lines for survival and prosperity had the effect of insulating the Navy from the hostility that the Army had felt. And this was reinforced by a long-held and strong instinct to look towards empire rather than towards Europe. But the Navy was hardly spared the guillotine either. The Sea Lords resisted the constraints of the Washington Naval Treaty for a host of sound reasons. But at the end of the day, Whitehall signed the document choking down the bitter pill of parity because it was far preferable to a naval race with the United States, which the British understood they could not possibly win. The Great Depression rocked the British economy, which had persistently high unemployment rates since the war. After 1929 into 1930 and 31, textile production was cut by two thirds Steel production fell by 45% between 1929 and 1932. In 1933, shipbuilding fell to 7% of its pre-war figure. In addition, the service industries of the city of London, which had become an increasing part of the British economy, were ravaged. In 1932, upon admitting that the 10-year rule might have to be re-examined, the Treasury warned that the situation was dire. The financial and economic risks the nation faces are the greatest it has ever faced in its history. But for the chiefs of staff, the defense situation was equally dire. They remarked in 1933, should war break out in Europe far from our having the means to intervene, we should be able to do little more than hold the frontier and outposts of the empire during the first few months of the war. A hard-won surplus in 1935 was shortly overwhelmed by great increases in governmental spending and defense loans. British decision makers now perceived themselves to be on the horns of an appalling dilemma. Forge ahead with a rearmament re that could not be afforded or resist rearmament and pose no challenge to Hitler's designs. Bankruptcy struck many as a form of defeat just as humiliating as failure on the field of battle. And here, let me quote Paul Kennedy. Um, I won't read the entire slide, but let me just, once you've looked at it for a second. There really is a terrible dilemma here. The country could either have a balanced economy, but with inadequate forces to protect itself and its overseas investments, or it could have much larger armaments and a bankrupt economy. It could not have both, and the post-Munich decision to abandon Treasury controls on defense spending simply meant that one hazard had been replaced by another. Coming to power in 1937, Prime Minister Neville Chamberlain was not at all inclined to commit an army to the continent. Chamberlain did not believe that Britain could or ought, or in the event would be allowed by the country to enter a continental war with the intention of fighting on the same lines as the last war. He said, we ought to make up our minds to do something different. Chamberlain posed, proposed a limit on defense spending that cut 70 million pounds from the army budget, and this is right about 1937, which caused design work for a modern tank to cease completely. And these fiscal limits continued through the Munich crisis. 
Chamberlain's government was inclined to invest in air power first, but by the late 1930s, the RAF was discovering just how much its practical capabilities had become separated from its claims. I suppose they always were, but it hadn't mattered very much in the past. This was a sobering thing to realize on the eve of the Munich crisis and during the Munich crisis in particular. Sir John Slesser, who was then the RAF's chief of plans, recalled the quote, gnawing dread of national shame and disaster that curdles the tummy and wakes one up at three in the morning to lie tossing and wondering what can be done and what will happen if nothing is. In 1938, the roles of the British Army were the, as follows. Protect the British Isles, guard the trade routes, garrison the empire, and fourth, cooperate in the defense of Britain's allies, and that's only after meeting all the other obligations. This isn't really very reassuring to the French. The budgetary limits on the army were finally lifted in February of 1939, and the cabinet authorized the army to prepare two divisions for deployment to the continent within 21 days, and another two for deployment within 60 days. And then there was a dramatic change. In April of 1939, when Hitler annexed the rump of Czechoslovakia, it finally became clear to Neville Chamberlain that there were no more cards to play on the diplomatic front, really. And he had tried to play every single one of them. God knows you couldn't accuse him of going to war um, precipitously. Uh, he had felt that there would be a way to appease Hitler, to find a diplomatic solution, to give him what he wanted, to reunite Germany with her diaspora populations around Europe. And perhaps that would be enough to create in her a satisfied state. Um, by April of 39, this was appearing to be um, a pipe dream. And so, uh, very dramatically, the government authorized conscription and wanted to build a mass army. The regular army would be increased to 16 divisions and the ter territorial army would have 16 additional divisions in reserve. Um, Doctrinal thinking had really been left uh, to dwindle for a long time. It was not very rigorous. Um, and so a lot of work had to be done very quickly and really the British Army was going to have to learn in the crucible of war or relearn many of the same lessons that it had learned at the end of World War I and had s since forgotten or set aside. If the Czech crisis had a silver lining, however, it was that it put an end to governmental dithering and divisiveness and instilled a larger sense of purpose among those in government. But Britain could not escape the dilemma that Kennedy, had no Kennedy noted. She would forge ahead and indeed would develop formidable capabilities during the, the Second World War with the help of American loans and Lend-Lease. But the effort would be so expensive and so financially draining that it would ultimately remove her from the ranks of the great powers. Thank you. <clears throat> After that bright assessment, I get to <laughs> follow with a sh some short, a short uh, discussion of the American dilemmas. And then I've got a couple of questions I want to throw out to the panel. So America starts this period focused on containing Japan which is seen as the biggest perceived threat in 1919. First little naval buildup, and then also like the, like the British with negotiated treaties, especially the Washington Naval Treaties. In 1930s, General Marshall's gonna hope that the deployment of B-17s to the Philippines would increase the turns in the Pacific, but instead that action served more to provoke. Joint planners, many here at the Army War College, developed coherent plans, the Rainbow Plans, Air War Plans Division One, for the next war, but executing them would take longer than expected as the Navy was decimated by Pearl Harbor and expectations for air power, as in Britain, exceeded capabilities. Ground forces, however, also took longer than expected to mobilize and become competent. But the draft and massive industrial mobilization eventually allowed the overwhelming buildup that everyone expected. Unlike the other four countries we've talked about, the Americans always expected that this would take a while and there would be a buildup involved uh, before we'd reach our, mass, our, major, our, our peak capability. Assumptions that we'd have enough time to do this proved correct. 
However, more isolationist assumptions that we could, have avoid, we could avoid another conflict altogether prove very, very wrong. Now, regarding land power, the United States did not really concern itself with building and sustaining the military force of a world power until the 20th century. Before that, as you all know in the audience, the regular army was always small. The expectation militia and volunteers could be called up for emergencies. While the Navy worried about keeping up with the latest technology, the Army did not. This all changed after World War I. But again, with the primary security threat being perceived as a rising Japan, the focus was on the Pacific and the Navy. The National Defense Act of 1920 did establish a base, base active force of 280,000 soldiers to defend the homeland and perform any necessary expeditionary duties, though they had a list of responsibilities very akin to the ones that Tammy put up for the British. The expeditionary part was the last part in their mission task list. The legislation was heavily influenced by the Guard lobby in Congress and depended on the Guard and an organized reserve to be able to mobilize an expected two million draftees in 60 days for war. So they felt they could mobilize a two million man army in about two months for war. World War I also showed the potential of new technology like the tank and the airplane. But as budgets got tighter and the Depression deepened, uh, the Army Air Force did still prove itself adept at procuring money to purchase new aircraft, but the rest of the force was much less successful at such modernization. Though partly that was because of internal policy. The Army knew it needed tanks and trucks and mechanization overall, but when budget priorities were set, Chiefs of Staff almost always favored trained soldiers over new weapons. There was an assumption again that the next generation of technology would be better and that educated leaders would be able to build and adapt the Army when necessary. Consequently, the service school system thrived in the 20s and 30s, and the best officers were assigned as students and to teach as faculty. In the meantime, the service did successfully develop and field some less expensive but important weapon systems like the M1 Garand rifle and a new 105 millimeter howitzer, and also invested in a lot of medical improvements that would save many, many lives in World War II. The big explosion of modernization, however, would occur during the buildup and execution of World War II, when the planning and priorities of those interwar chiefs of staff were generally vindicated. Much of this success was due to a board system where each branch developed requirements which a chief of staff then prioritized. When the budget floodgates opened to prepare for war, there were plenty of well-developed concepts on the table for programming. The Air Corps and Quartermaster Corps also proved especially adept at working with manufacturers to advance their technology. Probably the greatest failure was in tank development, which was due in major part to the lack of a distinct armor branch that was focused on developing that, developing that particular weapon system. Now it's got to be noted also, though, that even that overwhelming buildup had severe flaws, mostly by continuing to underestimate ground force requirements. The 90 Division Gamble was also a 273 air group splurge. <laughs> While commanders in Europe scrounged for infantrymen, brand new airplanes sat idle on American airfields. By the end of the war, all 89 U.S. divisions were deployed. All but one had seen combat. While only 224 air groups had been deploying, about a dozen of those to the Caribbean, and there were 12,000 brand new first line aircraft sitting on airfields in the United States that never got into combat. So there was, the expectations be build up were correct, but that build up was immensely wasteful and uh, relied on two mechanisms, the draft and mass industrial mobilization that we just don't have available to us today. So that's a brief overview, some good comments. We've used about the first half of our time. And I'm gonna take the prerogative of the chair and throw out two questions. One, fairly historical, one a little more deeply theoretical, and we'll, we'll just, we'll start with Rob and move down this way. We'll let the Germans start again. They start everything. Yes, they do. Okay, that, that's historically probably fairly true. Uh, okay, the first question for the panel, start with Rob, is what insights from your case study do you see as most relevant to strategists today? Yeah, that's, that, that is the question. Um, and at different times in the debate over what the Germans achieved in the interwar period, there, there have been different answers to that question. It, it seems to me that as I've looked and you know, spent a lifetime sort of soaking in the professional literature of the German officer corps, the military Volkenblatt, the military weekly, has just been kind of my, my, uh, my light reading for the last 30 years. Uh, 
it strikes me that what, what the, the Germans, if they had an achievement in the interwar period, if, if you think that what they turned out in the first couple of years of the war was an impressive operational package, which by the way I do, I think one of the ways they reached that was, was by avoiding what most German officers would call Einseitigkeit, one-sidedness. It was one of the worst terms of opprobrium that one German officer could launch at another. You're being one-sided. By and large, in the interwar period, the Germans avoided placing faith in some new novelty or some new trend that was going to overthrow the old verities of the battlefield. They believed that those verities were more or less constant, things like, uh, like combined arms, for example. That even if you invented a death ray, you'd still have to wrap it up in some kind of combined arms package in order to deliver it effectively and to, to protect it from, from enemy infantry. So um, the, the Germans, by and large, were not impressed with the all-tank concept in the 1920s and 30s. Uh, which the British entered World War II of quite enamored of. The British had an armored division, Air MOU, R-E-D, uh, which was almost purely tanks. It was hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of tanks and a single weak motorized infantry battalion to, to support them. Uh, by and large, the Germans were not impressed with the concept of strategic bombing. And, and now, <laughs> well, by 1943, when Hamburg is going up like a torch and then it's happening to every other city in Germany in 44 and 45, maybe we say, well, maybe they should have been. But by and large, that, that notion that the war was going to be, when I say strategic bombing, I mean the notion that the war was going to be over in the opening three minutes of the conflict, even before the armies mobilized by, by strategic bombing strikes over enemy capital and production centers. By and large, those concepts uh, were, were, were simply anathema to most German officers who thought they were silly. And again, you were, you were sort of read out of the room by being accused of being one-sided. One thing that reading, reading the literature in the original language does, so I, I kid a lot about how much of the German profession officer of course literature I have imbibed in my life but you do see what you know you see how language is used and 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 there is I'm not a postmodernist, so to say, but there is such a thing as a discourse. There's an, there's an accepted way of expressing yourself and one that we kind of read as unreasonable and, and unreliable. And for the Germans, it was whether or not you were being one-sided. So what they came up with was a panzer division, as I already mentioned it, which, which did have tanks and as many tanks as you like. The early panzer division had enough tanks to satisfy even the craziest tank fanatic. Um, but, but by and large, it was a combined arms division. It just happened to be built around its tanks. It was something quite a bit different than the, than the um, uh, allied uh, perspective, especially the, the British perspective. So I think this might be a time, this might be time for getting back to basics, if indeed we're in our time, a resource poor time, a constrained scenario, as we might say, especially constrained by funding. It's probably the worst possible time to think there's some new uh, wonder weapon or new weapon system that is going to solve all our budgetary problems. Well, my answer is going to sound like General Kukulo handed me 20 bucks to say it, but um, I think it focuses on two things, and, and one is the development of leadership at the strategic level, and the French army leaders of the interwar period are still, I think it's unfair to say they're fighting the last war over again, but they are still thinking about operational victory, not strategic victory. That is, they're thinking about how to move armies, they're thinking about how to fight battles, they're thinking specifically about how to fight a, a battle in Belgium rather than in France, which is the genesis of the Dio plan, but they're not thinking about how they're going to use their armed forces at the strategic level to achieve strategic ends. I mean, Vagon's the best of them, but even he's not doing that as well as he should have. And the second thing of two that I would say is to focus on the civil military a uh, bit because the civil military relations in France in the interwar years are really quite nasty, and they make a lot of options difficult to do, and they make it very, very difficult to develop what we would call a, a grand national strategy. And it's not that the French don't understand the concept, and it's not that they don't see the importance of having it, but what the military wants to do and what the politicians want to do are so at variance from one another, and as Rob said, the discourse between them, they just aren't talking to one another. There just isn't a forum through which they're sharing ideas at the level that they ought to be. And I think those are the two things that I would probably focus on. We're often using the same terms to mean radically different things. Exactly. Like security. Exactly. Security means something completely different. Yeah. Okay, I guess the first thing I would say is that if you are going to live in a representative democracy and, and respect what that really means, and if you are a military institution, you are going to have to prepare yourself for periods of feast or famine, boom and bust. Uh, 
and that's just going to be the reality that you will live in, uh, you will be subject to this often very fickle whims of the public and their notion of what's important and when and when you should spend money on defense and when you should not. And Britain after World War I, there was just very, very little political space for, a for an army. Uh, and the army that was going to exist was necessarily going to have to be very small. And it wasn't terribly well respected. And to some degree, that's because people didn't really understand how difficult it was to, to put together modern combined arms warfare. A lot of new technologies were arriving on the battlefield at the same time. And so in addition to the fact that the generals were in fact old school, many of them, um, they had a very, very hard task uh, in front of them to figure out how to make all this stuff work together. Um, but it was easy to have um, a simple solution, which was that they just weren't very bright and they had squandered the youth of uh, the nation uh, on the fields of Flanders. Um, so they were not looked upon very favorably politically. And, and so in addition to the fact that everyone was concerned about money, the treasury was terribly concerned about its financial, situa the financial situation of Britain, uh, there just wasn't very much political space for an army to operate in. Um, in the era of goodbye to all that and Wilfred Owen's powerful poetry and Alan Clark's donkeys and uh, invest in uh, Nix Neues. Uh, and so you just really, you have to be prepared. I think as a profession, you're in an odd position because you don't, you don't control your external funding. You have to constantly adjust. I guess I would say also that in these really thin periods, you have to work very hard to stay intellectually astute and to not use it as an excuse to stop thinking. The British Army was a very class-based, class-oriented organization, and so it kind of fell back into its old ways of polo and big game hunting and thinking about um, the annual steeplechase uh, and you, you, they just couldn't afford to do that. Uh, the world had moved on, uh, big things were afoot. They really needed to learn the lessons that had been learned on the battlefield and, and were making themselves so apparent by 1918. And really there wasn't a serious overview of, of those lessons, a, a rigorous attempt to, to, for the army to look at the lessons until 1932. And then Mill made a pretty good effort at it, but the next guy in line, Montgomery Massingbird, said, well, these are very awkward critiques of the officer course, so we'd rather, it's a very nasty business, we'll just censor it all and send out something much nicer. Um, you can't do that. You know, not when you've got Germany um, as a potential enemy in the future. And certainly by 1932, that should have been at least somewhat apparent to a few people. Um, the other thing is, if you resist innovation or if you don't even think about innovation for a long time, on the one hand, but then on the other hand, dramatically over-innovate, which is what the all-armor divisions are, um, you haven't solved your problem either. And I would say strategic bombing is kind of a radical over-innovation in some ways as well, but this one I'm pretty sympathetic to, at least for the British, because if, if you're a nation that doesn't believe it absolutely has to have a large standing army and you're a democracy, you will not have a large standing army. <laughs> they're very expensive and they're socially disruptive and they're politically disruptive. So if there's some alternative like strategic bombing and if you think you can get away with that because you've got the British Channel or you've got in the case of the US, big moats on either side of you and you can have this other much more uh, antiseptic form of warfare thought, fought from 30,000 feet and quick to boot, um, then you're probably going to opt for that. And it's going to look all the more appealing because, you know, if you've got the memory of Passchendaele so vividly in your mind, 
and you've got amputees wandering around on your streets and you're seeing the impact. And, and this is the first war where you bring home a lot of really wounded veterans and their parent everywhere. You want to think of something else. As Neville Chamberlain said, we, we ought to think of some other way to use force. Um, so all that's very, very powerful. Um, but I guess the, the lesson in, in addition to feast and famine is make sure you stay intellectually engaged. Make sure that you don't turn a blind eye to certain things you can't afford to turn a blind eye to. And don't look, as Rob said, for um, secret weapons and death rays. And, and if you do, look for those. Make sure you try to, try to integrate them into the system that already exists. Thank you. I'll just throw out a couple and I'll throw out my second question. But for the United States, I'd say a couple things that are really relevant today. First is the world doesn't pay a lot of attention to our pivots. And the second one is that in, in May and Neustadt's book, uh, Thinking in Time, uh, one of the points they make is when you look at any historical metaphor and a historical comparison, you've got to think about what is the same and what is different. And, and looking at, at what the United States does before and during World War II for expansion, you've got to understand that what's different. We can't do that anymore. We need to take the word expansibility and strike it from the lexicon. We just cannot do it the way we've understood it in the past. So that are my, my observations. Now let me throw out the second question, which is a little bit more theoretical and which led Rob Satino to, when I kind of gave him a heads up on this, it led Rob Satino to, to propose a North Korean solution. <laughs> uh, the question is basically, is the use of land power and, and investment in land power, especially difficult in a democracy. We'll start with Rob again. And move well, I think uh, my, my first comment when you first posed it, Khan, was that what is, I'm a German historian, what is this thing democracy you speak of? <laughs> um, Germany was a democracy for a very brief period in the period I study, and that was from roughly 1918 to 1919 and 1933. But it went to war, arguably precipitating the First World War, at least that is my point of view, in, 19, in, in 1914 uh, with, with a, oh, I, I don't know, a, a sort of sham constitutional quasi-authoritarian, no one knows what to call the Kaiser's system, but, but definitely then precipitated World War II, I don't think anyone d disputes that, with, with something approaching totalitarianism. Um, and, and, and we look at, uh, it, it is difficult, of course, to, for democracy to risk things like land war, uh, as, as Tammy said, look, look, look what Britain, look at the price Britain paid, and that's what everyone thought. Uh, and that's, that led to my, my snarky comment, you know, the North, North Koreans have discovered this, that the, the absence of democracy leads to the existence of large standing armies with no problems, no problems at all. So I don't want that on tape as uh, the fact that I'm advocating a North Korean solution to anyone's problems. I just want that stated. <laughs> I guess the, the first observation is that America's problems, though we certainly have them, are nothing like the problems France was facing in the 1930s, and we just need to understand that. Or even, I would argue, what the United States was facing in the 1930s. Um, our, our problems are surmountable. Um, and, you know, my view, not the Army War Colleges, several of them are self-inflicted problems that are surmountable. Um, I think it depends on how the place of an army fits into that democracy. In the case of France, the political polarization of the 1930s made certain options simply unpalatable. And oddly, to my mind, one of those options was to build a large standing army for fear that it would end up as a military arm of the very political domestic enemies that you feared. So there's no point, if you're a French socialist, in building up a powerful French standing army if a French version of Mussolini or Franco, to say nothing of a French version of Hitler, is just going to take over that armed force. Right. There are other uses for your defense dollars. We're not in that position in the United States. Um, at least I hope we're not. Um, so I think it's, but I, I guess the, the, the simple point, I think Tammy hit it right on the head. If you're going to be a democracy, you have to expect that your system is going to be politically messier than will a system in, say, Rob's socialist paradise in North Korea. So <laughs> I'll, I'll stop at that. Um, the night after, or the night of Pearl Harbor, my grandfather huddled with some of his neighbors and talked about 
what they would do with their draft age sons, um, military age sons. And the conclusion that they came to for my uncle, my, my father was at that point too young to enter the military, but my uncle was old enough. They would put him in the Army Air Forces before he was drafted because the Army Air Forces would be a safe place to be. Um, <laughs> I think one of, the, one of the things that's difficult when democracies think about land power is they think about land power as tending to be more costly. Um, and, you know, I guess we could do assessments of that. Certainly strategic bombing in the Second World War was very, very costly for those who implemented it. Of course, also as well, as Rob mentioned, for the civilian populations on the other end of it. But uh, perhaps it's the nature of the casualties, and certainly the nature of the casualties in the First World War, where they just were so incredible, so overwhelming, so ghastly, so unbelievable, uh, that the idea of ever doing this again seemed incredible, impossible. Uh, and it was only after Hitler eliminated all other choices that the British came to terms with it. Uh, I think any time we've, we've look, looking at our situation right now, after two long wars, Iraq and Afghanistan, much longer than we expected, far more casualties than we had been led to believe, there's a turning away. There's a sense that, you know, was this worth what it cost in, in blood and treasure? Um, and maybe even a, a sense of guilt among the domestic population that did not fight, that you think to yourself, well, Let's not have to send people. I didn't go and do this, but I, I'm looking at people who are gravely wounded because of this, and perhaps we can figure out some better way to settle our differences in the future. Um, so I think those are all those all factor in, and there's also the sense that if you if you engage land power, it will be longer and more drawn out. And this, of course, was the leverage that Dewey was trying to utilize when he was saying wars will be much quicker. They won't involve these four-year great slogs in the mud. Um, and so that had appeal. It was, it was very powerful. It still has tremendous political appeal in this country. And even if it's sometimes unrealistic, as it often is, we don't always size up the situation and say, what's it really going to take? Um, or how will the enemy be able to resist the course of impact of air power, which they very often do. Um, but we want to believe <laughs> that air power will be a silver bullet and that land power is going to be the slow thing that we want to avoid because it was ugly last time and we don't want to do it again. Um, so I think there's a tremendous sense that, well, let's use coercive leverage, let's use sea power, let's deep strike sea power, let's use uh, air-sea battle, let's use those kinds of tools. And again, in a democracy, I don't find that at all surprising. Um, one last thing, let me run back to my first question, your first question, Con, and that's don't be short-sighted. And here I'm gonna say that if the, the United States never was willing to forgive or even ease the burden of debt that the British and the French owed to us after the First World War, which I was, was ironic, I think, because in a lot of ways it's sort of cutting off your nose to spite your face. In order to, to pay the United States, they had to get their pound of flesh out of Germany to some degree. Uh, also, by the way, private lenders were sending money to Germany so that the Germans could pay their <laughs> reparations payments back to us. So it was a very interesting merry-go-round. But we were unwilling to stop and say, well, you know what? If we ease up on the British and the French, maybe they'll be able to ease up on the Germans. And maybe that'll change the domestic political situation in Germany. And maybe even the British and the French will have more money to buy the stuff that we're building, like cars. And so we won't be investing in things that ultimately they can't, they can't afford our stuff. And so that all adds up and helps facilitate the Great Depression. So um, be financially astute. Don't be short-sighted and try to have a global approach to capital and to the, the global economy and not just your domestic economy, even though that's very, very challenging politically. You know, Tammy, the, the end result of that, that money transfer, that money go around, is, is that U.S. banks were then turning around and propping up the German mark, keeping it afloat at times when the Germans were nearly bankrupt. And so that, that money would then be used to pay reparations and then used to pay the war debt and then go 
never released, the money never stopped anywhere to build a road or, or to do the right. things you want to do with money. I agree with your, com your comments, sir. <laughs> okay, we've got a, thrown a lot of ideas out, and uh, now this is the time when you guys earn your, your keep a little bit. <laughs> and, uh, we're open to questions from the audience. Uh, Mike Lynch is our mic man in man more Mike? ways than one. <laughs> and uh, you got to yeah, push the, even. He, just there, second. there it is. Oh, you don't have to uh, yes, I'm Russell King. I have a question for Dr. Citano. Um, it's about strategist stealing, one country stealing a strategist from another. For example, uh, Alfred Thayer Mahan was a naval strategist, and I, I understand the People's Republic of China and their string of pearl strategy in the Indian Ocean uses Mahanian concepts. And in World, World War II, there was a tank commander named Hobart, a British tank commander, and he was discredited in his own country. Uh, but I, I, I thought I had actually read that the uh, Germans took some, uh, some of their tank warfare ideas from Hobart, but maybe Hobart took it from the Germans, and, he, he, and the Germans just took it back. I'm not sure. But um, to what extent can we adapt foreign strategies to our own purposes, and what do we do when another country takes our strategy? And uh, Because other countries ha have different political goals. You were mentioning, for example, Germany. Uh, being a small country and having quick, easy wars. We have long wars, and we have to integrate it with, with a political situation afterwards. Right. It's, a, it's an interesting question. I, I can't say this for, you know, with complete 100% assurance, but, well, the, the Germans were pretty aware of the various British prophets, so to say, of armored warfare, of the, the Little Hearts and the, and the Fullers and the Hobarts in some way, and a, and, and a few others as well. Uh, I, I think that most German armored doctrine was probably of German provenance, although there was, a, there was a, an international body of officers who were writing in the 1920s and early 1930s on these points. Um, Hobart's an interesting character. Uh, he, he would rise to the command of an armored, the, of the first of the British armored divisions, if I'm not mistaken, in the late 1930s. Um, even driving around with a chauffeur, constantly urging a chauffeur to drive Faster. So that, that, that was British armor doctrine in the ninth, in, in early period of World War II was, of course, just speed and the tank charge. Uh, about what you can do when someone has stolen your, or, or has borrowed, or has adapted your ideas, of course, there's nothing. There's an old German uh, um, uh, fraternity drinking song, Die Gedanken sind frei, which is thoughts are free. You know, they just float around out there and anybody can do whatever they wish with them. They can, they can adapt them and trim them as they see fit. Um, I do think in my, you know, my, my scholarly uh, bailiwick, as it were, which is a German military history, I do think there's a bit of danger in, in the, the notion of uh, adopting foreign terms and just making them your own. And one would be Auftragstaktik, which is a very famous German term, which means that the commander devises a mission, Auftrag, and then allows the uh, other uh, lower-ranking officers to decide the, mission, um, the means and methods of carrying out that mission. So it's a decentralized system of command. Um, insofar as you know, decentralized command is an interesting idea we might want to think about, and the US Army has a version of it uh, as, as well. Um, it, it's fine. When one makes a fetish out of certain foreign terms, and I think that the, at least in the period I, as I've been a working scholar, the 80s and the 90s, of course, it was German terms that we made, that, that we fetishized the most. Auftragstaktik, Blitzkrieg, Kesselschlacht. And, and, and then when, when, as a historian, we try to go back and find just how the Germans use these terms. And I see Dr. Echevarri is in the room, knows exactly what I'm talking about here with Auftragstaktik. Blitzkrieg would be another one. Now we find the Germans didn't really use it at all. Um, it becomes problematic. I I'll say this, you know, the, the Germans in the 1920s, if we admire their thought processes, which led to this new form of mechanized warfare, uh, they would never have used foreign terms with that much regularity at the time, or at least fetishized them in the, in the way that I think we have. A long time ago, an uh, American officer, Dan Hughes, wrote a really good article, a military review perhaps, late 80s, uh, about the uses and abuses of German military history and the notion that we, we find some some belief that we think we have about the Germans, and then we all sort of repeat it until it, it takes on the ring of truth, and then we, we, get the, we, we learn just enough German to be able to quote the one, the, the first, the one word or the second word, and now we've got a, a brand new concept. You know, you can't, really, you, you can't really borrow someone else's culture. You live in your own culture, and you can certainly talk about ideas and adapt them in ways that might harmonize or, or might work for us, let us say. But it's, it's much more complicated than I think people normally give it credit for. So there was Little Hart who always claimed, I invented Blitzkrieg, and the Germans read my articles, and by God, they went out and used them while I was sort of discredited or not listened to in my own country. 
I mean, that's false on every level. <laughs> Everything Little Hart said was listened to, and certainly the Germans didn't just borrow his ideas willy-nilly, and he certainly wasn't the father of Blitzkrieg because there's no such thing as Blitzkrieg. It's, so so it's, it's, a, it's a much more complicated process, I think, than we normally give it credit for being. Todd asked me to say a little bit about air power, and I'm just thinking this through. Um, you know, one of the interesting things about the World War I experience for the Brits is that they feel compelled to totally restructure their, their defenses because of the, what Crenshaw later calls the great popular outcry for retaliation against Germany, against her own attacks on Britain in 1917 in particular. And what's interesting is I think the, the elites really misread uh, the way that the population received those attacks. There was a, a, a lot of writing about how there was panic and terror and fear among the population. And when I went back and really tried to look at that to write my book, I, what I found was something different. I didn't really find panic and fear so much as I found anger and indignation. And people thinking that, you know, the government shouldn't allow this and we should be doing it back to them. So in the interwar period, the, the British were, uh, Trenchard was arguing, well, what you have to do is get in there and really knock the pins out of the enemy quickly because, and knock them onto the back foot, knock them onto the defensive before they can do it to you. But that turns out to be a fairly problematical concept because as everyone knows now, what happens is the populations proved to be pretty robust, darn robust in World War II and have proven to be pretty robust since. Um, under the fall of bombs. And so this notion that you will just simply in, induce panic in a population was misread from the start, um, but it, it was so widely believed. And I think to some extent that had to do with perhaps the difference between elites trying to understand uh, the behavior of the masses to some extent. It may have had to do with simply the fact that the population wanted a say in the governance of war. And that, that in itself was unsettling for populations in Europe, for, for, for military institutions that hadn't really faced that before. You know, how, gosh, this, what do we do with these upstart people who are gathering at the Tower of London and demanding things. Um, that's unnerving, that's unsettling. Um, but I think they, they drew some of the wrong lessons out of that. Now, if somebody else borrows your doctrine or steals your doctrine, I guess the one thing you can say is you, you ought to know the strengths and limits of it yourself. <laughs> so, so you should be able to assess it pretty wisely, although we tend not to do that. We tend to look at things through odd national lenses and rose-tinted glasses and strange filters based on past experience and selected perception and cognitive filters. And so I, I'm, I'm very, um, I'm not very optimistic about hu human ability to look at things really objectively, but um, certainly we should make the effort to do so. Question over here. Thank you. You've spoken of governments and politicians and military and strategy. My question is about industry. If I think of Germany, the first thing I think of is a certain munitions family. If I think of England, I think of a, the phrase island of shopkeepers, but I also think of Lloyd's. When I think of the U.S. during the time period, I'm thinking of uh, railroads and steel. That means Carnegie's and Rockefeller's. So I was wondering if you take a look at the industrial perspective at this time. Thank you. Sorry. Yeah, uh, you, you said a certain family, uh, a certain family, and obviously uh, you know, Krupp and, and, and some other corporations as well. The big strategic problem, of course, for German industry in the, in the 1920s was it was being prevented from producing the weapons that had been so profitable for it for so many decades, that it, it had been producing, uh, Krupp producing big gun tubes and, and, and uh, guns for naval vessels and, and uh, the primitive tanks that Germany was churning out, but could have been churning out in any number in the 1920s and 30s. And so when I, I mentioned that one of the things that would really be worth, you know, another hour-long discussion here is the way that the Germans sort of uh, passively uh, uh, resisted the treaty by, by blocking weapons inspections. And of course, at the epicenter of that are the Krupp works in Essen, uh, 
and and it, the Germans believed that they might have won World War I. Mike did this very uh, ably for the, for the French. If they had preserved some kind of inner, inner, uh, uh, inner unity, uh, they called it the Burgfried and the, the peace within the castle. Germany was besieged, so there has to be peace within the castle. And if, if it was formed in 1914, all the parties kind of s suspended, their, suspended their, their problems with one another, but it re, it re birthed itself by 1917 and 1918. Um, but that Bergfrieden was kind of recreated on the floor of the Krupp works uh, briefly uh, and, and numerous times in the 1920s and 30s when uh, army officers and executives and the workers themselves blocked blocked uh, allied uh, inspectors from, from seeing the things that they wanted to see and blocked them from seeing the things that Krupp didn't want them to see. So uh, certainly uh, Krupp was the motor of the First World War Army and, the, uh, and, the, and it and other f industries like it is, is going to be the motor of the Second World War Army as well. But, but Krupp was, Krupp could not do that, could not do anything until a certain freedom of action had been returned, and that's 1933 with Hitler coming to power, and then of course the, the, um, the declaration of open rearmament in 1935. Germany uh, 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 rearmed in what can only be called a crash fashion after 1935, and if you think about it, went, went from zero to, to 85 miles an hour, so much so that by 1939 there was a great deal of talk about industry overheating. The, 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 the industry, the machinery was going to have to be replaced, uh, modernized. There was going to have to be a temporary suspension of production. Now, the, the, then the war broke out in 1939. And if you are an economic determinist, which I've never considered myself, but it's always worth uh, opinion to consider, if you're an economic determinist, uh, the Germans uh, launched a war just at the time it appeared they were going to have to slow down rearmament. And slowing down rearmament would have not just meant problems with, in terms of arming the new force, it also would have meant a, a, a return to unemployment. This is an, a state that now uh, boldly proclaimed and, and, and declared itself to be in favor of full employment and celebrated it with great fanfare by 1935 and 1936. And was Hitler going to be, could Hitler tolerate even a 5% unemployment level, we often think he's an all-powerful dictator. Uh, and, and I guess from here I'm launching from industry into sort of more political issues of political economy. But could, could Hitler tolerate uh, striking workers in front of the Krupp plant in 1939? I think the answer is no. And whether or not that was the single deciding factor in launching the war, I'll, I'll, I'll leave in abeyance for the time being. I guess I have two sets of answers to this. I'm not sure which one to go with, so I'm going to go with one and see if it works. Um, I think it gets back to Khan's point too about participatory democracies. Um, unlike France, where unlike Germany, excuse me, where where labor unions are abolished, where workers are ordered to order work more hours, the French response during the Great Depression, for political reasons, is to empower the labor unions, similar to what happened here in the United States. And a point that I always make to my American friends, especially a couple years back when the French went to 36-hour work weeks, um, the French Declaration of the Rights of Man explicitly states that the right to work is a human right. So it's not an unusual French response to cut the number of hours in order to make sure that everyone has access to the human right. So I guess this is by way of saying that the French political culture, unlike the German, valued debate, valued dividing power away from the state into labor unions, into industry consortiums that were consistent with French economic culture but that proved detrimental to keeping its industry at the level that it should have been. And it's important to recall, I'd like to do this with American students too, France didn't, just, France didn't just take care of itself in industrialization. It lost its coal and oil fields, it lost many of its steel factories. It still, it still armed itself and largely armed the US Army as well. So it, it has to be considered an industrial power as well. I'm not sure that's a great answer to your question because I'm not an economic historian, but that's about what I think I got. My second answer is not very good, so stick with that one, please. <laughs> but it's better than you think. <laughs> I say better than the one I just gave. <laughs> when the First World War ended, Britain had a large military industrial complex operating with a lot of sophisticated weapons um, already built, many in the works. They were working on a long-range four-engine bomber to fly to Berlin by 1919. Um, there was a lot going on, but as I said in the talk, the stomach for continuing that uh, really disappeared, and quite dramatically and quite quickly, once the war ended. 
And people thought, and again, this is a democracy and you have to respect if these people are gonna vote people into power, you have to respect what they think. People thought it was time to stop building military machines and invest money in social programs. Um, and so, as I mentioned before, defense industry really was starved for a long time. And when it came back, it came back in a sort of spotty fashion, good in some places, not very good at all in others. Um, even within industries, for instance, within aircraft, and the aircraft industry, you see very good short-range fighters being developed and very poor long-range bombers developed in the first part of the, the war. The Whitleys, the Wellingtons, the ferry battles, basically death traps for those trying to fly them. The Manchester, uh, also a disaster. And finally, in 1942, the Lancaster, which is a successful bomber, but takes a while. Once you slow the momentum and shut this stuff down, it, it is hard to get it back online and not to lose momentum, to lose knowledge, to lose capability. Um, but it, uh, in the larger context, uh, it's simply going to be inevitable sometimes that military industry is going to be shut down according to political preference, popular preference. Um, I guess what you have to think about is how do you preserve a base that can be expanded in a sensible way? And I'm kind of curious to, to hear Khan talk a little bit more about why he thinks it's not easy to expand readily and rapidly in the same way that we could in the past. Um, and maybe what the industrial implications of that are. Okay, you'll have to have to show up at lunch tomorrow. I'll talk about that in my lunch talk tomorrow. <laughs> the one thing I'll say, though, that one of the things that, that's about American industry that's amazing is that what makes the American industry so successful in World War II is the ability of common... The, the bottom line is the American economy at home is so strong, and there is so much going on, even with the Depression, that there is such a massive industrial capacity doing making refrigerators and Fords and, and, and Chevrolets that you can, you can very amazingly rapidly turn into to military production. And companies that are making pan, pots and pans are making bayonets the next day. And, and everybody, of course, there are economic incentives to do that. There's some other things going on. But it's this transformation of American domestic economy and a military economy that's amazing. And, and, it's, it's, and it's not just having military industrial capabilities, having industrial capability at all. And that's one of the problems today. We just don't have the industrial base to start with that we can even transfer over. So that's one of the reasons for it. Okay, other question, question here in the center. Scott Eflon, for the panel at large, during the interwar periods, what was the societal expectation of, of, what, of the institutional military? Was it, were they happy with it being just a men's club where the second son found a job? Or was there an expectation that it be a labor pool to do civic works at the edge of the empire? And then given that perception during the interwar, or I'm sorry, given that expectation during the interwar period of the institutional military, was it changed by their experience of the, of the war? Thank you. I, I, I think for, when we say the interwar period, of course, for, for, for my country, Germany, there's really two, and it's the, it's the Weimar period up till 1933, and then, then the, years, the early years of the Third Reich from 1933 to 1939. So in that first interwar period, uh, the, 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 for much of the period, the Republic was a, well, it had, it had risen out of revolution. It was ruled by the socialists, uh, officially, more or less an officially pacifist line, and the, the army was highly suspect. Uh, the government kept the army at arm's length, and the army, frankly, kept the government at arm's length. And it was, there was a deliberate deep, General von Zeich, who was the chief of the army command in this early period, declared that the army will be unpolitical. But I hope no one's too naive to think that an army can be unpolitical in saying we do not support the current constitutional regime. We have no opinion one way or the other about it. It's a profoundly political statement. And so there, there were things like General von Zeich, the chief of the army command, allowing the Hohenzollern crown prince 
the, the, the now defunct Hohenzollern dynasty, the former crown prince to take part in Reichswehr maneuvers. Uh, while it, um, American, when I tell this to American undergraduates, there's just question marks, so what, who cares? But of course, I think you can see why that would be a, a problem for a newly established democracy. So the social, ex insofar as there was a social expectation, it was it's too bad we still, ha I mean, for many of the socialists, it's too bad we still have this army at all. And the Navy was even worse. The, 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 the Navy had mutinied first, which had led to the revolution that created the Republic, and had, that, that mutiny had been uh, eventually crushed, and ever, the, the top echelon of the Naval Command were the most arch-reactionary people in the state. Now, in 1933, uh, th there's another revolution. We sometimes, I think, fail. Hitler came, we say the Macht der Greifung, the seizure of power, which is false, but it's just brought into power by a kind of shady backstairs deal between various political groups. But nevertheless, it is a revolution in that the old expectations had now been overturned. And uh, what was once a, a, a very tiny army was now going to be expanded, and it was going to be, once again, a form of the old Prussian nation in arms, this time imbued with national socialist ideology. It was going to carry out a war, eventually a war of extermination against Germany's enemies. And so it's a, it, it, it's a, it's a dizzying change of expectations. But in general, uh, the, re the Republic, in general, the Republic kept the army at arm's length while the, 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 the National Socialists took, took it over completely and, and attempted to, and I think succeeded, in imbuing it with a new consciousness and imbuing it all the way down to the lowest level. Steve Fritz has written a very good book a few years back now called Frontsoldaten, which means fr it's front soldier in, in uh, German. Uh, and, and he has, you know, he talks about ordinary German soldiers writing home letters from the front. And while some were saying, you know, give my, I hope mom's uh, sciatica is better, uh, other letters were saying, you know, we're out here fighting for a better world. We're fighting the Bolshevist enemy. We're, we're laying the Jews low. Uh, Hair-raising uh, phrases, you would think from a, we always sort of blame the officers for that, but it had clearly sunk far down the, 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 the level of rank into the German army. So it's a very different set of expectations, uh, in 1933 being the hinge. I, I would say the French army is supposed to protect France, but beyond that, I mean, this is the army that, has produced coups, it has produced revolutions, it's the army that got involved in the Dreyfus Affair, it's the army that got involved in the Boulanger Affair, which is a little less known, but was a coup attempt against the Third Republic. It's an army that was involved in scandal after scandal after scandal. Um, French people expected the army to stay out of politics, and um, it doesn't do that in the 1930s. And again, I, I, you, you just cannot overestimate the importance of the Spanish Civil War model on one border Mussolini on another border, Hitler on another border. The, the fear is not so much even that the army will stage a coup itself. The fear is that somebody else will take power. If you're fascist, that's a communist. If you're from the left or center, it's a fascist. And then use this professionalized army against you. Um, that, that cannot be understated. So the, the, the question in France that gets asked in the 30s, does this army belong to the state or does it belong to the nation? And Rob and I have a French friend of ours uh, who's a strategist with the French army who is firmly, the, the army belongs to the nation, not the state, which is a way of saying that if the army is asked to do something contrary to the ideals of the people, it, it has an obligation to refuse those orders. It's a different social expectation than it is here in the United States because of this history of revolution and scandal and coup d'etat and everything else. You know what I'm talking about. I think the, the question of professionalization and, and who were these institutions in Britain in the inner warriors is, is quite an interesting one because clearly by the turn into the 20th century, you've entered a period of increasing professional consciousness. And yet after the, the First World War, there is, with the shrinking of, of all of the services and particularly the army, there is a, a tendency to move back to an older style. Um, and this is seen not only in the army where, you know, a lot of it's about polo and big game hunting, but, but in the RAF where Slesser says, you know, it was kind of a part-time occupation for gentlemen, off, officership. Um, so it's got all of these services, I think, have a, a kind of divided identity where they're trying to decide exactly what they are. And oftentimes, at least for the RAF and the army, it's it's falling more into the category of gentlemen's club often than it is modern service in the way that we would think of it um, for the 21st century and with the example of the U.S. Army or the U.S. services. Um, 
clearly the, the army is expected in the inner warriors to garrison the empire and to help assist with the empire and make the empire part of what makes Britain great and economically productive and so on and so forth. Now, of course, as we know, empires are often expensive and they don't always give you the, the bang for the buck that you're hoping for. Um, and they can be very draining as they were for Britain. But there was still a, a certain expectation that the place of army officers was out in the, in the far reaches doing good work for the metropole. Um, for the Navy, clearly it was to control the sea lines and to continue to preserve British sea power, which was essential to Britain's survival and her economic prosperity in particular. So that task hadn't changed very much and was understood in largely the same way. Um, the air power role really was to assist with colonial policing and then to be a deterrent force. Um, because nobody really wanted to think that a war could happen, um, but you still had to worry about the prospect of this developing technology, which was long range bombardment, and you wanted to have at least a way of deterring others from doing that. And if you had to suffer that consequence, you could turn it around, turn around and do it to them. Um, but again, the degree to which the, the rhetoric and the capability actually merged is very problematical throughout most of the, the inner war years, and it only merges very late in the day. Um, so I, I guess uh, everybody's seeking their role, and to some extent the role is fairly clear. And in, internally, inside of these institutions, the identity of professional as we know it is still unsettled. And there is a tendency to shift back to an earlier time when it was if, the, sort of the job for the second son. Yeah, the American experience is well, most of you know, is basically, you know, you've got signs in the South, you know, no, no Negroes and soldiers. I mean, soldiers aren't very much respected in the 20s and 30s. It's, we, we, it, it's, a, it's something you do when you have to, when there's emergency, it goes kind of go back to the old militia tradition almost. You know, when the war kicks off, we go from this 200,000 corps to 11 million men in the Army and women. They go out and do their job, and they all get out as soon as the war is over, and what's the first thing we do? We do the Doolittle Board because all those citizens that served in, in, in uniform said, you know, this discipline stuff was too, too harsh. We need to make this different. So they, they start changing the army to make it kind of easier, almost less professional in the enlisted ranks from the Doolittle Board and some of that stuff. So there's almost a backlash against it with the enlisted ranks and the American situation. There's great respect for the Pattons and the Eisenhowers and the general officers that won the war, but it's not seen as something that's really there's, even after the war, there's not a whole lot of value seen in being in the U.S. Army. Another question? Mike Peelish. I'm reading a book about Eric Severide's experience, mainly when he was an embedded reporter in France during the, the battles with the British, uh, with the Germans, rather. And Eric Severide made the observation that similar to the comment earlier that the Germans exercised. He observed that the German soldiers were physically fit, were marksmen, and that the French, on the other hand, were not physically fit and were, were not ready, so to speak, in, in, let's say, the soldier readiness point of view. So the question is, how do you reconcile soldier readiness if you're not the aggressor, if, if you're the defender? I, mean, I think it's, it's a really difficult problem for France. I mean, what is it exactly you're building a military for? What is exactly you're militarizing your society for? Um, in France in the 30s, they're all defensive goals or negative goals, which is to say France is a status quo power. It doesn't want anything. Um, there, are, there are basically two schools of thought, and I'm generalizing here, on why France lost this in 1940 as badly as it did. Some who argue that it was decisions made at the point of attack in 1940. Uh, Robert Doty's book on Sedan being probably one of the, the leads in this. There are others that I think the more dominant school, the Mark Bloch, um, Irene Nemirovsky's book, Sweet Francaise, I mean, that really argues that, that France in 1940 is a, is a corrupt, is a paper tiger, that, that it, it is a society that is, just doesn't have any goals worth fighting for. It doesn't see anything that it wants to fight for. Um, I mean, I think that's a huge problem for France in the 1930s. I mean, what is it exactly you want to spend money for? If the Maginot Line is going to do what you think it's going to do, uh, 
what are you building the rest of a military for? Where is it going to go? And French politicians don't have an easy answer to that, which is why when Germany invades France, you get this you know, phony war or sitzkrieg, whatever you want to call it, where, where there's this period of just not knowing what the French army is really there for. It's not built to invade Germany. So, you know, I, I'm, I'm a little suspicious. I think some of this comes, these images of the French army as being kind of overweight, out of shape, blah, 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 decadent. I mean, some of this, I think, fits stereotypes that are too simplistic. But there certainly is something to the observations of people like Severide, Mark Bloch, Irene, you know, Nemirovsky, who are saying that, look, that, that this just isn't an army that it, it doesn't understand what it's trying to accomplish. And I think there's a lot to that. Certainly, you know, part of, the, part of the National Socialist experiment, but also fascism in general, is to get young people, especially urban young people who are living unhealthy lives, out into the countryside and <laughs> militarized Boy Scouts kind of things. Hitler Youth, from, you know, Hitler Jugend would be the most famous one, and I think the one everyone here would know. Um, I, I, I too am always a bit skeptical about the Germans are somehow more physically fit in, in 1940. I don't know what their what washout rates were for for German recruits as compared to French recruits. It'd be an interesting statistic to find. But if you're in the middle of a battle in which one army has been defeated on some level, tactically, operationally, strategically, and they're in flight, and the other army is coming at them and looks confident, they probably seem 10 feet tall, and they probably seem a lot more physically fit. So I, I you know, without arguing with a primary source and one who was there, I, I, I would call it into some question. But th this was definitely a part of taking youth and, and giving them the, you know, the, the, putting the gleam of the tiger into their eye and making them as hard, hearts wie Kruppstahl, as hard as, as hard as Krupp steel, as Hitler famously said. It was a, the, the Japanese did it to a certain extent. The, no one did it more, however, than the Italians. And they failed miserably in battle, despite all those that, the physical fitness programs that the, the young fascists ran during the, the course of the 1930s. But it definitely was, you know, physical fitness is, is a good thing, we'd all agree. And in the 1930s, it was used in the service of the Nazi state in Germany. And if I may just throw in one more thing, too. I mean, I did this book on the liberation of Paris in 44, and you see a lot of this. As soon as it's obvious that the Germans are defeated, you see French observers starting to talk about how out of shape and how bad and how frail the, the German army in Paris looks. And, <laughs> You know, I, the, the, I guess my point is, I think there's a lot to what Rob is saying, that perceptions come upon when things changed. I mean, when you can see it in athletic teams, too. I mean, they, there are points where a team just all of a sudden looks weak. You know, Michigan, my, my team, did it last night, right? I mean, they, they looked great. They looked taller. They looked faster. They looked everything. And then all of a sudden, it wasn't there. And I hate to make the facile analogy, but you certainly see it in 1944, where Parisians are saying, this is not the same German army. Well, I mean, it is the same men as it was a week ago. Just something as different has happened to them in the interim. Severide was embedded with, the, I don't know the book, embedded with the French? Interesting. And this is his memoir? Okay. Right. I'm going to look it up. Thanks. Yeah, John Steinbrecht wrote in the 1960s, I believe it was, he wrote an essay and he said, I'm really, really glad I live in a country where people are very poor at marching. Um, <laughs> And I, I think he, you know, he's trying to get at this idea that Americans aren't by nature militaristic, uh, that they're fiercely independent, they don't like to come together in groups and sing military songs necessarily. Um, and I think we all, you know, if you look at the iconography and the film history and just the, the literature of the Second World War, we, cert we take a certain degree of pride in the fact that our soldiers can address the way they wanted to, to within boundaries and, and took some liberties with uniforms and weren't all exact images of one another. Uh, I think that to us, that sort of reflects back to us, our national character, and we're proud of that. What I think is really interesting, just thinking about this question in general, and clearly there, there were preparedness movements during the early part of World War I and the early part of World War II in this country. And now that we have an all-volunteer or really all-recruited service, um, one thing that's quite interesting is that it, I guess it's a reflection of the soundness of our civil-military relations that the iconography, the imagery of our services is um, cutting edge, very aggressive. Uh, get out there and do the job. Uh, have the best machinery, have the fittest people, have people who are willing to do just incredible things physically. Um, you know, we've all seen the recruiting ads. 
And they send a very particularized message that we want to have an elite in our armed forces. Uh, and we do that without worrying about the fact that those people could come back and bite us. And I think that's a real interesting statement about American civil and military relations, just kind of looking at, looking at the culture and reading the texts of our recruiting adverts on TV. Yep. Time for one. Okay, here please. we go. Oh, I, th I thought you had a question. Okay, go ahead. This is uh, probably for you, sir, because uh, you're representing the U.S., but it's a question now about the um, identity of our Army. I think being here at the War College, we've, we've heard about that as the identity of the Army, and, and that's in view of, of maybe the purpose after Iraq and Afghanistan. And uh, also the fact that we kind of see that Congress, and I think I'm generalizing here, but Congress during peace funds Army readiness, whereas you could kind of make the argument that the Navy, Air Force, and Marines in some uh, in, in some way, they're, they uh, they fund missions. Uh, air sea battle kind of talks to that, and maybe Marines being the nine one one force uh, talk to that as well. But uh, in view of this, do you think that uh, you know the new concept of uh, regionally aligned forces it tries to address this? Um, and if so, um, what things probably need to change in either authorities or, or those kinds of things to make that really a, a good concept? Wow. That's a, that's a tough question. It takes about three panels to answer. Uh, actually, I'm getting involved in a project on that very soon. My problem with regional line forces is, what do you do on the second deployment? It's like the problem I have with any of these, having constabulary divisions, all the other stuff. Okay, but the Army gets deployed is normally for a time, a long time. Who goes next? You know, we create this brigade that's real good in, in Africa. We send them to Africa. They do the, then who does the second rotation? Uh, you know, I think we need cultural awareness. I think we need, uh, I mean, there, there is utility to, to have an awareness of, different, of, of areas for training, for this mill-mill uh, -mil relations, for security assistance training, and that sort of stuff. So that, that's where the value is. We don't need experts to speak all the different languages in the area. We need people to kind of know, those, know the region. Having people arrange, setting up long-term relationships is good. That's a good idea for, the, for those, those, those particular areas. I think we're fooling ourselves off. We think it's good to create any force structure additions for the Army or uh, we, we're, we place too much hope in it. It's a good idea. There are utilities to it for missions that aren't going to get us a whole lot of force structure anyway. But again, I think it's, we, there are general skill sets everybody needs to have because, you know, talk to the, all the Spanish-speaking Special Forces guys that have been in Iraq and Afghanistan. <laughs> I mean, that, that's just the way it works. You, the Army goes where it's, it's told to go, and you can't predict. You can't pivot somewhere and say, by God, that's where it's going to go, because we always end up going someplace else. Louise, did you have a question? Okay, I think we're out of time. Good questions. Good, 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 good. Uh, very alert. I didn't see anybody fall asleep. I only saw two or three people run away in, in angst when they had the North <laughs> It was the North Korea thing that the I North think Korea drove them out. <laughs> uh, thank you very much. Enjoy your reception tonight.